I assume you don't, you just don't track C standard, right? <laughs> That's probably what people usually does because there are people don't even track in C ninety nine standard. So um, let's start with some uh, hopefully short introduction about this feature in C. So C ninety nine standardized the uh, type generic math symmetrical functions header, um, but did not say how to implement it. So those ha so for example in GCC lips uh not in, in yeah using GCC as a compiler this can be implemented with a compiler extension called uh, type compatible p it's a uh, micro like function to tell uh, whether the type is the uh, same as another type in C. So as you can see, C community standardized something that didn't actually work. It does not tell you how to implement it. But later in C11, they standardized a feature called generic selection expression to make it work. And the idea is very simple, as you can see here. Um, you define a macro. This is called a type genetic. Uh, this is bad. I, I'm not going to point it out. I'll just try to use pointer. OK. I lend you my pointer if you want. What kind of? Oh, the red? Yeah. Uh, OK, I, I can try that. Thank you. So this one is called a type generic function. Um, it has three variants. One takes long double, uh, du this one takes double, and this one takes float. And so you can see the gen type generic expression uh, takes the first argument as the expression to filter on. It's examining the type of this expression, and for and return an expression from the candidates. So as you can see, the intention is clear: long double is forward to long double, uh, integer or doubles are forward to the double version of log two, and this one is forwarded to uh, float. And to wrap up the macro. Uh, the original argument is passed in the place of, uh, uh, say, template. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, say uh, function argument. Mm -hmm. And there's no problem with the macro name matching the default function name. No, mm, you can. So, if there is a name appears in macro, it's not evaluated again as a macro. So it, there's no confliction here. So uh, let's look at again the syntax. Um, the names I some some names are taken from the C standard. Some names I just uh, I, I invented those because in C standard those names are only defined syntactically. Like this is called a assignment expression. Who hell knows what that means? Um, so the first argument is a controlling expression. Uh, each one of these is called a generic association. Um, and the first, uh, the part before the colon should be type name or default. And the next part is a uh, expression to choose from. Let's see what those means. So all those expressions only the finally selected candidate expression is in a, um, a potentially evaluated context. All others, like this, this, are all in unevaluated context. Uh, of course, in C standard, there is no term called unevaluated context. It's 
just for instance, this one is not evaluated. Um, each type name should be a complete object type. There are two things here. Complete means at the point of trying to evaluate this whole expression, those type name should be uh, must not be an incomplete object. This uh, might have some interesting interaction with uh, template instantiation. Uh, we are going to see an example very late. Uh, and it needs to be an object type. So in C++, um, reference type doesn't work. You cannot put a reference here. And op function type doesn't work either. That's not a f but a function pointer works. That's an object type. Another example is you cannot put an array of unknown bound type here. Because in C, it is and uh, variated modifiable type. Uh, in C++, array of unknown bound is just an incomplete type. So different, thing, uh, different things into standard, but you cannot use it here anyway. <coughs> the third thing is kind of tricky. The controlling expression is decayed before the type is being evaluated, uh, examined. Um, we are going to see some example uh, of that later in the next slide. Um, two, and of course, as you can assume, no two generic association can have the same type, and uh, can only uh, have one default. Are CV qualified types different types in C? Can <laughs> uh, you repeat the question for the camera? Okay. Is CV qualified types different types? Yes. Uh, and that is why C wants this expansion to be decayed. Otherwise, you have no way to examine a const int here. But it's not a problem in C++, right? We have various ways to alternate types. The result expression preserves select the can selected candidate expression's value category. So if this is an L value expression, the whole thing, by being selected, this whole thing becomes an L value expression. If this is a PR value, the whole thing becomes PR value. OK, so next thing we talk about uh, implementation, sorry, uh, about the uh, decayed problem where it's in next slide. I forgot I have this one. Uh, so far, GCC and Clan both implemented this feature. GCC implemented it correctly. Clan implemented it wrong. Uh, but only Clan allows the generic such thing in C++ mode in C++, since C++ 11 and turned on by default as an extension. If you don't want to use it, you need to turn it off. So in C++, what works? Dependent types as candidate types works. So you know what that, uh, what does dependent type means, right? Uh, a type depends on some template parameter, so that you can use it in templates. Can you go back? Okay. So dependent types can appears here. Uh, another thing I tried which works is, if you want to use generic selection expression as, uh, as a uh, in a expressions finding, that works as well. But I haven't tried all the cases. I look at the client source code, I believe um, all kinds of error are, can be uh, treated as, as finding. Uh, the one I specifically tried is if the whole expression has no matched uh, generic selection, it's not an error. Uh, other things include, like you have repeated types, that probably works as well. What doesn't? Uh, so far in Clan, if you want to use a generic selection expression to compute a return type in a function template, that doesn't work. The error I got is uh, currently we cannot mangle it in C++. Uh, I don't know why. But since this doesn't work, the expression funny has does not have that much use. Uh, I don't 
writes uh, I'm not like Eric <laughs> that use that feature that much I don't have a use case for conditional uh, expression is funny sorry so this part is not discussed in this talk um, the last thing is important why I say client implements this is wrong because the controlling expression is not decayed so here's the effect in GCC you can use char a character star to filter on a string literal but you cannot use a array type to filter on it so what I listed here is this this thing only works in GCC and this thing doesn't work in GCC and vice versa this part as a exhaust hello uh, Clang OS as a char 5 and not a const char 5 uh, on the, the generic meow this one? the one above the generic meow on Clang uh -huh. that's char 5 and not const char 5 y yes can you please repeat the question? Oh. Why clan accept the string literal as char five, not const char five? Char five. Uh, it is because the string literal is an L value, and uh, actually, I forgot. We can try it. I think that's because uh, in C you don't have to have string thing const. Whereas in C++ you do. So I think that's the reason why. But in C you're oh, yes. Exactly. Exact. So if they're not doing the decay rules correctly, why are they doing half of them? Yeah, very possible. <laughs> a different subset of them. Oh, yes. Here is the point. In C, the string literal is, uh, has no const. That is true. I tried this in C, not, not, not in C++. It doesn't mean it doesn't have const. It's just not necessarily. So it, the okay. requirement is, it is weaker. OK. Yeah. So from here, you can see the reason why um, C wants a decayed behavior. Because the main purpose is to use this to forward functions, right? It doesn't matter you decay first or later, because in C, all functions arguments are automatically decayed. So it's much easier to have it, the type decayed in the first place and then examine it. Otherwise, you don't even have a way to examine the array type, uh, a string literal, because you don't know the length in C, but you can do it in C++. Uh, and also, it, you, in C it's very hard to filter on um, uh, both const qualified type and unqualified type. Then uh, one more thing I want to mention, although a reference type cannot appear here to be matched, you can match on a reference type because the type we get from here is the type of expression. Even you have an uh, uh, L-value reference, but when being treated as an expression, this is just an L-value expression of type int. So, in, which means if you put something here, you don't need to manually remove, the ex uh, remove reference. Kind of convenient. So, uh, since we only have this implementation to try in C++ mode, and actually C++, it's okay to compare against the exact uh, type. In this talk, we use clan semantics. It's fairly easy to simulate G, uh, the correct semantics using exact match semantics, right? We are going to see, see how to do it later. Sorry, um, oh? is, is GCC wrong? GCC is right, is wrong. Oh, Clang is wrong? Yes, there, oh, is, a, okay. there is a bug on Clang's bug, uh, bugzilla. We are tracking, tracking on it. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so the actual issue is that TGMath or type generic macros are not part of C++ at all. Clang is simply allowing, as an extension, their C implementation to leak into C++. Mm. And I think we're about to find some interesting things as a consequence. This is why I'm here, so, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Part two, let's go try this in C++. The first topic, the generic selection expression exam on an expression, right? 
it's examining on a controlling expression. How do we examine the type? Like I have a template, I ha already have the type. How do I examine the type in the generic selection expression? Anyone? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. What do you, when you say, how do I examine it, what are you trying to achieve? Here. This is an expression. Okay. Right? I want to, so with this syntax, ex I'm examining the type of this one. Mm -hmm. But in C++, I often have a T. Mm -hmm. I don't have the expression. But I still want to filter in on that. What do I do? You want to use Devil 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 yes, exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah. First try, the default constructed is an unevaluated context anyway, so that works. But what if it has no default constructor, right? That could well. It's um, unevaluated context. It does not violate anything. But there's one thing I want to mention that sometimes this doesn't work. And the reason why this doesn't work is extremely tricky. So uh, it doesn't work in lib, it sometimes doesn't work in lib to C++, the library shipped along with GCC. And w the reason is they create an implementation of this function containing a static assert saying you cannot instantiate it. The reason is in standard, the standard says this one must not be auto used. But here is a cause and results problem. If one function is auto used, the temp function template is, is instantiated, right? But instantiate the function template doesn't mean it's auto used. So I believe GCC's implementation is kind of false, give me a false negative here. But on the other hand, since this is a C feature, it's not clear whether the controlling expression is instantiated or not. So client and lib C++ can have a debate here. The solution is simple. If you found a problem, just simply copy paste the implementation from standard, which is one line of deco type and use it here. So since it's very useful, we can define a macro taking the type instead of the expression and forward the rest to the generic selection expression and the use is put type here. Okay, here's a use case of examining the type. Think about, consider this problem. We have, we know how to write a string literal but we want those literals to be prefixed with the corresponding type. How do we do it? If you look at uh, Visual Studio's file system header or Boost uh, Chrono IO header, you'll find many specializations returning exactly the same thing prefixed uh, with a uh, corrected uh, to you know to specialize each of this and repeat those things and prefix them. Um, but with generic selection expression, we can simply do this. Define a macro. Take the type, filter on the type, concatenate the prefix with the literal. There you go. So how do, why this work? You can have a feeling that the generic selection expression is like uh, doing template specialization with, uh, with inside an uh, expression, right? This is specializing and you got an expression as your return result. And so we can do token pacing and other macro manipulation on the right hand side of the colon. Yes. <coughs> uh, excuse me? Sorry. We can use the token pacing in other macro expansion facilities on the right hand side of the colon. Yes, it's just in a macro. That was not clear from the earlier material. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah. The slide speaks to me. But okay. This okay. Is, this is useful. This is, yeah. yeah, this is very useful. Sorry. No. Is the type matching being done at the preprocessing step? I mean, this one? We are matching the type and returning basically. Uh, 
some preprocessor macros. So when are we actually matching the type? Uh, first, this macro is expanded as preprocessing. Uh, when this is being matched, um, this is matched at compile time uh, after the preprocessing. If you run process of the whole thing, you'll find uh, you'll still find the on score generic with uh, everything here. But since all other un unselected expression are in unevaluated context, it doesn't matter. Only the selected expression will generate real code. So an example you see is you put type here and the narrow put your narrow version of the literal here and you got the <coughs> uh, string literal uh, where every character is of that type. We call it type generic literals. So to be honest, I think this one is useful enough. Like if you want to paste your string literal and character literal everywhere. If you don't want to and still want to answer the original question, just do this. Define a variable template. Uh, the variable template is, uh, contains a character array. Point to what you got in the previous slides. And this technique also works for any type uh, type of neutrals differentiate with prefixing, postfixing. Like if you use it on an integral literal, you can uh, easily generate the li literal of the, uh, that exact type without uh, calling integral promotion, implicit, con implicit conversion, something like that. The next topic how to produce a type from a generic selection expression. What the generic selection expression returns is an exp expression. I want to get the... type? Yes, exactly. It's, it's very simple, right? Just do tackle type on the whole thing. So you may notice that here, we imp our input, the controller, uh, the, our input is a T, right? a type. And what we return is also a type. This, what we got is a function taking a type and return a type. We just got a type function in EOP without a name. How to call it? Type lambda, right? So since we have a type lambda and since traits, all traits are type functions, you can imagine how I'm going to use it. So the example is if you have a trait you want to implement, like its floating point, the traditional way to implement is uh, write a helper, fill, uh, doing specialization on every type you want to do, and finally forward the helper, remove the civic qualifier so that you don't need to specialize for const, uh, const volatile, volatile again for three times. So this is already kind of compact, but you see there are a lot of bottle code here, like templates, structs, all of those helper names. So with type generic selection expression, here's the implementation. Create a trait, inherit from the type lambda, and the type lambda is simply removing CV, filtering on specified type, returning the boolean, uh, bool constant, uh, bool constant object. This, if it's a floating point, we return true type. Otherwise, false, then you're done. It's one single template, no specialization. So I think you fixed the bug from the previous slide here as well, but I'm not sure why you're constricting true type values when you're saying it's a derivation. I think the parentheses at the end are wrong. Where? The no, parentheses no. have a true type and false type? This one? Yeah. You need this because the generic selection expression is returning expression. This one is a type. It's not an expression. You need to construct an empty object of that type. Oh, sorry, yeah. decal type. Okay, yeah. Finally, you have a decal type here. I got it. <laughs> if you go back a slide, I think that's infinitely recursive if I call it with a non-const qualified T. If it's a non-const qualified T, 
Oh, no, it's forward I'm, to I'm the underscore. The underscore. Okay. Yeah, US, yeah. I'm sorry. Actually, this code is originally written as is floating point underscore imp, so that you won't be confused. But you see, I cannot fit this yeah. into the slide. I, I see. Uh, There's too much code. I was thrown by the one missing underscore, which was actually the whole <laughs> code. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So in another hand, you can say how much code there. And how simple this is. This is. That, that, that puts it at a place where it's much more obvious to me that there is no such bug. So <laughs> it's pretty more clear. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this a lot. This is. I, I really now I'm beginning to wish that this was in the C++ plus <laughs> plus. <laughs> 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 So, next topic, controlling the produce type. This is a continuation of the last topic. We know the produce type, right? You can just deco type it. Uh, how about I want to use a type to declare a variable? So, in this e example, uh, I assume the default association is selected. <coughs> and does it work? So hang on a second. You're selecting on the. I'm selecting on um, whatever, and I finally got this. This one is evaluated. Select. This one is selected. So in the worst case, I'll get a decal type of T, which should, as you say, do. it looks right. But the fact you're asking the question and say first try, <laughs> I think I've missed something. <laughs> so okay, let's make it more simpler. What I'm what I'm going to do is I call this function with three which this one deduces to int. So it's like declaring int t. So the type of t here is int, right? And I select this type. I'm like putting it into deco type. And seems I should get a int, right? And declare the variable. That's what I would expect to happen. But unfortunately, that's not true. Parentheses on the decal type? No. Oh, no Reconsider different. how decal type is defined. I always get confused whether I need to add or remove parentheses to get the reference or remove the reference. The decal type is defined in two ways. If you put an identifier or a function calling or whatever, if it's a one entity, we are getting the, di the type of that entity. If it's an expression, we are, we are modifying the result type according to the value category of that expression. So that is how why deco type i is different from deco type parentheses i because the i is an entity for in the first, uh, first category the next one when it's being recognized as an expression it's for to the z category and you know how this modified right x value uh, l value pr value and how the hell the my type function give me a reference here is because what generic selection generates is an expression. Generic selection expression is defined as a root level expression in C. So the whole thing is an expression. And remember at the, pre the beginning when I'm explaining the semantics of this, I say the select the, the whole thing preserve the value category of the selected <coughs> expression. So this is an L value. This is being treated as an L value expression. I finally got this. I can remove yes. <laughs> you went too fast. <laughs> 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 this one? Oh, this is this is just what I told. Okay. <coughs> it preserves this uh, value category. The the value category can be 
anything. Like if you put an L value, uh, PR value here, um, uh, L value somewhere else, you can get the exact um, value category of any selected types. So you can see that this is not replacing itself with the selected type syn synthetically. It has its semantics. It's a true expression. I didn't think T was allowed to be void, though, because that's an incomplete type. Oh, oops, fuck. Sorry. I'm going to fix my slides later. That's horrible. Void is not allowed in that case. Void star. Yeah, smart. <laughs> uh, so, how do we control the producer type? We can just reverse engineering deco type, right? So, if I want to get a PR value, remove the reference, want to get an L value, add the R value. This one is a little bit more tricky because you cannot say add R value reference because by adding R value reference, if your result type is an L value, give you an L value reference, because of uh, reference collapsing, you finally got your error value reference. So use this, just to move it. This is unevaluated context anyway, so you just use it as that case. And you got what you want by reverse engineering deco type. I don't have a use case for this, but do remember, right, when uh, you went into tricky issues. Uh, so, the next topic, how to examine value. So, in the previous slides, we tried, so the original uh, generic selection expression exam, the type on an expression. Later, we tried exam a type, and we tried to produce a type. Now, how about exam the a value of an expression? Do I need to turn the value into a type? Exactly. In that case, I'm going to bow out and let everyone else have fun. <laughs> turn the value into a type. Right? I have a value of integral. Put an integral constant wrapper on it. And you can do some tricky algorithm based on the value because I'm evaluating, examining the type here. But it turns out that this is very, not very useful. I spent some time to write this, but as you can see, since we have constants for functions, this can be simply written as a loop. You don't need to do this, it's pointless. So why is it pointless? Because all the e expression I'm returning have the same type. Right? At worst, I can do this with tiny operator. Just do remember, what is the shining part of generic type selection expression? It's that you can return heterogeneous answers. You can produce things of different types. So this comes to our next use case. So given an email, use it in tag dispatching. So I'm, first I'm going to explain why you want to do so. So sometimes people write email and use it as a non-type template parameter. Like they write F and you pass the email in the uh, angle brackets and call the specific function. Um, the benefit is email are fundamentally integers, so you can do some calculation on it. And it's easier to do specialization on it because you, you are not using uh, tag dispatching, which just overloads the resolution. Uh, and the, the values are uh, can be continuous. So you may be able to write an algorithm to do some recursion on all your um, uh, specializations. On the other hand, there are some benefits of tags because 
tax can inherit from each other. And that is why we want tactic dispatching, because we want some types to maybe to represent that the type uh, can be used. Uh, the type is a uh, uh, is a another type, and can be used in the the implementation can be used on a higher cat uh, um, tag hierarchy. Tag can uh, form hierarchy, and in that case, you can refine your alg uh, algorithms based on the tags. But the email is a value. Tag is a type. How to do tag dispatching on email values? We just learned, right? We can produce a type from a, uh, a value. First, we introduce uh, a helper, which creates uh, a ty complete type from a value. Here I'm using uh, still float one style as an example, but this is really, really bad example because those styles does not have hierarchy. You just switching on all those all those uh are you know um on the same hierarchy. Um but this is merely an example. So this part is not generic enough but maybe we can have some language feature to make it generic. It's being proposed, but anyway. So the, this helper does two things. First, it converts the value into a type. Uh, another thing is not that obvious here. I'm enforcing this type to generate itself. This is, as I mentioned before, the, if you want to use a type in in place of the type name of an association, that type is required to be completed. But if this thing is being used in, uh, so if this thing is uh, will appear as a dependent name, a dependent type, and dependent type only when instantiated, it's completed. This one, the, this one, forgot. Uh, okay, stripping the type name and the colon colon type. This one is not instanti instantiated if you use it in a exp uh, on evaluated context. This one is merely a specialization. Okay? To instantiate this thing, you need to enforce it by doing this. Like put it in a uh, non-deduction context. This is the only tricky thing here. So if your compiler gives you an error, I want a complete type, let's do this. So here's how to use it. You write one template without specialization, just one template, variable template, examine on the type, uh, examine the value, based on the converted type, and you get the tag object. Right? Write all of this one by one. And how to use it, since it's a variable type, you don't need to have a anything at the end to get the value or something. Just call the template, put your email in it, you got the type object. I call it email dispatch. Um, any question about this so far? How much time I left? Oh, too long time. Okay. Next. <coughs> Since we're already able to exam an uh, integral value, Boolean is an integral value, right? We can also exam on the value of Boolean. So how is this any better than just doing a constant expression of, um, with just a switch statement? I'm going to talk, spend half an hour to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
This looks like <laughs> switching. All right. Kiss true, kiss false. And moreover, this will look like you have if else, right? This is just replace the runtime value and uh, it's static if, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean you could do that with the cost expression too. Not static if. Not static if? Okay. Uh Static if you you can put const expression here, but anyway, let me keep going. So if I write a if statement, oh sorry, sorry, if I write a state if statement, and this is a compile time boolean, give you a compile time boolean value at oh crap. If this is a constant Boolean value in modern compiler, this one is guaranteed to be optimized into one branch. Uh, no compiler can miss this optimization. There's no way. Because the whole thing is translated into SSA, and you've got uh, constant propagation, dead code emulation for free. So they don't actually generate code. And actually, on the committee meeting, Chandler says, if you only want, if you want a scope, uh, why you still want a static if when I can optimize the whole thing? Why, how if is different from static if in that case, if they generate the same code? We're checking on time, not time. This one? No? Well, the input is the same. With static if I expect only the chosen branch to pass, the other one might not pass correctly. That's as specified in the current st static if paper, the latest version of the paper, but that's rejected by Bionian and all other people because those things must be possible. Otherwise, you can have horrible things happening. Um, I'm not proposing that proposal here, but just let me explain. Why? What is the fundamental difference between a static if and the if? Whether it's passed or not is an... Okay, I, I, I don't want to talk about it. So, there's a why. In static if, this may be passed, maybe not. Uh, de depends on definition of static if, but at least at minimum, those two branches must be in an unevaluated context. Uh, actually, I got something wrong here because the true branches, just true branches, potentially evaluated context. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you got what I mean. Unevaluated context is fundamentally different from potentially evaluated context because simply there is no context called evaluated context. Mm -hmm. All contexts you write, like in your normal program, are potentially evaluated contexts. And what is the cost of what is the cost of potentially evaluated contexts? Like the sender says, if you put a function call in potentially evaluated context, that's an order use. Order use requires the program to be compatible. It doesn't matter whether you generate code or not, it must be compatible. Which means, if you put an expression that is not compatible in a false branch, the whole thing fails. Here's an example. Uh, first, forget about the false part. Assuming it is an iterator, i is an index. This syntax is only compatible for random access iterator. Nothing else. If it's something else, I can try other syntax. Assuming the input, the iterator I got is not a random access iterator. If I remove the static here, then this is required to compile. It will give you a hard error. But if it's a static if, since it's unevaluated context, we can do something about it. And my suggestion is to discard this branch as if it's finding out. Imagine I have a 
genetic lambda here, and the whole lambda disappears. It does not necessarily need to be specified as uh, this one, this part does not pass. I don't like it because if it's required to be not parsed, you can put something very awful like one half of the curly braces yeah, and yes. define things that makes the whole thing into a very low level abstraction. Our minimum request is that this must at least be an unevaluated context, I mean the fourth branch, and hopefully it's finding out. So, about static if. First, the fourth branch is on evaluated context, and the fourth branch, we hope, it can be ill formed. That's the definition of how finding works. Like, if the expression is ill formed, uh, we just discussed it, uh, nothing happens. And only the true branch is potentially evaluated and required to be well formed. Uh, let's go back to our example of examining a value using generic selection expression. There's one little difference between this one and static if. That is, all the branches are required to be well formed. Uh, what well formed means, um, this is not required to compile, but it must satisfy, satisfy the semantics requirements of the C++ language. So this one, in fourth branch, if the iterator is not a random access iterator, this one is not considered as a well-formed expression. So if you simply do this, and you will get an error. But since the, both uh, the, the f fourth branch is unevaluated, is in unevaluated context, we can do something about it. As I said, we can simulate this funny behavior by creating a function object, and the function object's call operator is templated. And to do so, you can simply use generic lambda. Since it's unevaluated context, the function object is, will not uh, compile uh, in the fourth branch. And we use generic lambda to forward uh, all the arguments we are going to examine. That's going to work. And it does. So here's my library implementation of static if in macro. Um, don't take this very serious, right? It's much harder to use instead of a language construct. Um, but it shows a concept, and it's correct. This, this is why you'll not get TT math in or type generic from C11 into C++. I would see why not. Because people want this. I know people, I want this. <laughs> I, I want this because this, is, this would save me so much hassle inside my code, having to arse around with you know, partial instantiations and stuff. And I could just write this and be done with it. And it was so massively easy by maintenance, a long list of other benefits. This should be in C. I'm not very sure whether the, generic, the underscore generic should be in C, but I'm very sure static should be in C. <laughs> we really want this. So, um, all right. Um, I, I'm talking. I'm going to talk a lot, little bit about how this works. So, this first part is capturing the uh, things you want, uh, the ob of objects you want to examine. This is because you cannot do an automatic capture in Lambda, because uh, Lambda, a generic, even it's a generic Lambda, it's still a class, right? When you capture these things, it captures uh, member, uh, data members. And 
even your call operator is templated, the C++ standard requires you to go through the templates, try to look, do a lookup, uh, to name lookup on all the symbols mentioned in your template, and try to see, try to verify each symbol that is not dependent has a valid semantics. By the way, in old version of GCC, if you simply capture them using the lambda capture, it compiles because it does not check semantics. But in C++11 and newer compilers, this is required to be checked. So what we do here is I wrote a I wrote a macro to forward all the IDs you want to exam. Right? Using the uh, auto ampersand ampersand idiom. So this part goes into the arguments of the generic lambda. And I don't actually capture, capture anything, because the capture simply doesn't work uh, because of the reason I just explained. So, uh, and later, I repeat those IDs and put, in, in, put them into a call expression. So I, I capture those IDs as arguments, call them using arguments. In that case, uh, compiler has nothing to ver uh, validate the whole thing is type generic before this part is being evaluated, right? And re do remember, within the generic selection expression, this whole thing is an unevaluated context. So compiler has no idea. W only when the, cur the true branch is being selected, I call the function. Then we go into the evaluated stage. So there are a lot of uh, macro hex hack here, and I actually have no idea about how this works. Uh, I simply copy paste from a uh, macro library to make the uh, list processing of macro work. Uh, <coughs> and finally, what I got is two syntax, right? Uh, the one with, without the else branch, and one with the else branch. And you need to pass in all the things, uh, all the names you want to exam. So apparently, this is worse than a language construct because language can capture all these things very easily. So uh, there are several, several caveats here because since the body becomes a lambda, um, if you do a return here, it does not return to the outside of the function it returns from lambda. But on the other hand, you can make use of this, right? You can write a return expression here as outside of the expression. Use the whole statement as an expression. That works. But if you've got different types coming out of your static if you have to deduce the result from the return type. It's not required to be same type. You can write a function with an auto here do a return. Yeah, so you do, you do <laughs> use the return type from the return expression. Yes, 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 yes. You can, what I want to say is simply, you can write a function has a return, uh, has an auto here, and return different types. Yeah. As long as this one, oh, uh, no, sorry. That doesn't quite work. You need one more level of forwarding uh, because, um, sorry. You can't do it. This is a restriction of C++ language. You can't have one function signature depends on the value of your input, no matter it's uh, hard, uh, no matter it's constant or not. You can't do it. For C++ 14, though, you can, right? No, either. Sorry, I've not heard what your restriction is. The restriction is, even you, if you put an auto here, the auto will not be two different types. 
but it's not going to be two different tabs. It's just going to depend upon the input type because you'll select one branch or the other every time, and the branch you select is dependent upon the type you instantiate with. Yes, but I can show you. The, I'm sure this will not work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can you have the same signature have different return types? You can yes, have. You can for templates. Yes. You can overload or enable if return type. So what's the nice app? If this is. Um, so I think your auto will actually work here. That's almost approaching D levels of expressivity, you know, where you can have. I, I actually discard oh, the language feature. Uh, that yes. Work of uh, auto with the I, I see. I see. I okay. Oh, okay. I, I, I see. Um, it doesn't work if. I'm examining the value passed in here, but it works if the the thing I'm going to exam is a template parameter. Yeah. Okay, that works. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's it's not one function returning two possible types. It's one temp one template generated to a signature. That's okay. So, you can imagine if without the whole uh, uh, generic uh, lambda trick, this will not compile because uh, character string, uh, string literal has no dot size member, and this one does not work on stu string. Part three. Um, this part is a little bit short. It's mainly for discussion and exploring. So in open uh, urban champion meeting, uh, Bionni showed us a possible future language addition called inspect with. This is a pattern matching in C++. Probably powered by Mac 7, uh, which was presented, I think, last year here, and also last year in on C CPPCon. It's in all modern languages, except C++. It's very useful, obviously. You can have a pattern, and I hope we can have some pattern to extra extract multiple values, I mean, to, to match pattern of an tuple. Uh, and we can use those pattern to um, match expressions, those kind of things. Uh, but the uh, I, uh, by the way, I forgot the details, like whether I need to break here, whether the default is named as default, I forgot those. That doesn't matter because this thing is not the one this section is going to discuss. The one I'm going to discuss is a feature Bionni showed us, and he says it works. If this is a pure pattern matching thing, it should match on an expression and ex examine its value right at one time. But Bionni says this is also able to work on a type. You can put a type here and f matching with those, what those are. These are concepts. Concept is a predicate, right, with a template parameter. So simply when the input is a type, what he is going to do is to use those as type predicates apply on the type and examine its value and he also he also claims that syntax like this works which doesn't work in this branch on here so we very we are very close to something like static if right it's unevaluated context and the fourth branch is not required to be well formed. So, how about this? We, create, we still create a Boolean constant based on value. We have some, we create a, an identity concept which simply returns a value from a bool constant. We call it this one true branch, another one fourth branch. We got static if again. 
So, why not just give <laughs> this to us? Um, one more thing I want to discuss is the difference between inspect with and the underscore generic. Um, so, first, these are concepts, obviously. They only didn't show us an example filtering on putting types here. I'm not sure whether it works, whether it should work, or something else. But if it doesn't work, that's a difference. Filtering types instead of concepts. Uh, another thing, obviously, this is a statement. So you probably can expect you can go to from here, return from here. But on the other hand, you, you cannot put this into an expression. So that's the difference. Even you can use this as a generic selection expression, you don't get the full benefits of uh, doing inline specialization. You need to wrap it into some expression. So I had a suggestion to this. Um, if you remember uh, the standard ML language, uh, standard ML has a uh, pattern match, uh, not sorry, OKMO, which is a variant of ML. It has a uh, pattern match right on the argument of the lambda. So, I don't speak camel, so. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So, it's a lamb So, imagine you have a lambda, and you have a parameter list. When the parameter list has only one value, you can simply put a match keyword in front of the parameter list and write your whole lambda f function body in terms of a match body. So it's like an embedded syntax. You don't need an actual level of matching. So what if we have the similar thing on lambda? Since one lambda is an expression, you are examining on one input. You probably be able to uh, embed the whole thing as an expression. So, uh, so in that case, you got something similar to generic se generic selection expression. Uh, but I'm not very sure. This is. Bernie only showed us once, and he probably don't have a language implementation for it. We will see. So, summary of the talk. The generic selection expression works like an inline specialization in, with a very compact syntax, and it's a, a, uh, it preserves the value category of the selected expression. That's a feature, not a bug. Um, very useful in some cases. Sometimes I cannot think I imagine I still have to do specializations everywhere. That's too long to write and kind of hard to maintain because it can be splitted into two different uh, two locations. And it's very interesting. Thank you, uh, C committee. You did something very helpful to the C plus plus committee and again. Um, but pretty much less helpful to yourself. Um, and we really want static if. And the static if should do uh, the fourth branch, uh, branch is an uh, unbedded context, okay to be ill form like uh, the, so, so that it can be discussed as being spanned out. And two branches potentially evaluated. And both provides scopes so that you can to give something or declare something and use it later outside scope. That just breaks the uh, general common sense of program language and makes the whole thing very low level. So that's my talk. Uh, questions? So just there, just there, the inspect at the end from Jarni, um, that's kind of like a more generalized version of the C11 generic. So C11 generic is a subset of inspect. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not very sure. G Bionni did not show us an example of filtering on types. He only showed us filtering on concepts. Concepts is type predicate. Right. So 
may or may not. I'm just thinking, I mean, obviously I'm relating this now to Rust, and in my head, you know, you can do anything you want in Rust. You can express it. Yeah. Matching, matching, matching. Yeah. You can put in, you know, uh, array ranges with, you know, a pattern in them that will match the range versus a different type of range, you know? And I mean, obviously, all of that would be fantastic if we had that in C++. But I was just thinking, um, if you can encode it as a type, then you can give it to the generic operator in C11. And I can see how you could get some metaprogramming to take an input and to generate from that a type, which it then goes and gives it the generic, which then gets it to come out with various outcomes. The trouble is everything I can see you can do with generic, you can also do in C++. It just requires you to type a lot more code. Uh, would you say this is true? Mm, I mean, not is anything generic can do okay. in C++ cannot So type. the question is, uh, today, Wait a second. With or without this? Well, my my question is: is can generic do anything that C plus plus cannot do? That that's the question is: does generic uh, does C plus plus can do anything that generic selection can do? Uh, most of the thing. Uh, one thing that doesn't work is the type generic literal. Yes. Because the literal is a literal, not anything returned. Uh, returnable from a function, like you cannot return a string literal from a function. Um, and even for variable templates, it's something different. Uh, it pre when it preserves the value category of the expression itself, it's a lot more easier to generate uh, real expressions when you really want it. That's the difference. But mm, uh, mostly, yes, you can do them or similar to get the similar behavior in C++. Uh, but the syntax is more compact, and sometimes the syntax is more correct. So what happened to the inspect proposal? Is it no, it's not even a proposal. It's, it, not even a proposal. it's a presentation. Bernie showed us once, he, and there's no paper behind it, I, I know it's a result of uh, Bjarni, Gaby, and um, Paul Zos, that guy's research. So I assume it's backhanded to uh, the Mac 7 library, which is written in, fully written in macro and requires some preprocessing. Uh, but when it comes, I hope uh, this works better, and uh, hope we don't need to write this. And finally, I hope we can get static if this is very important. Like uh, really another a uh, commit member. If you are tracking the uh, standard proposals, he wrote. a paper saying we really need static if just in the meeting last of uh, during last week this paper basically explains uh, what kind of static we want how it's different from the old one which works on syntax level this one works on the semantics level uh, it provides scope and requires both branches to be pa passed. So maybe we can call it hygienic static if, because it does not pollute the outside scope. Um, any other questions? OK, thank you for coming.